got so much back, I think I'm never running out. Yeah, bust me down a whip, bitch. I don't do this. All right, please welcome in my guest, Rafa. How you doing, bro? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm doing very good. I know you have a game in two days, so are you prepared? Yeah, we have a big game coming up in California. We had a good week of preparation now. It's about traveling. We travel tomorrow, get there, get used to the hot California weather and playing on Saturday. Excited for it. That'll be fun. I'm sure I'm sure traveling that far to play is not easy, but I'm sure it's fun to go to an away game like that. Yes, for sure. I mean, it's not easy because especially there where the time changes mm-hmm. and the weather is different. But those road trips can be fun. And also, we got to take care of business. Yeah. Um, so I read up on you a lot. And it seems like you've been a lot of places. You've had a long journey. You're young. You've had a long journey. But I kind of want to go back. And I want to hear about your life in Brazil and how you made it to where you are now. Uh, so yeah, I'm from, from Brazil, from just outside of Rio. And of course, like every boy from Brazil, uh, my dream was to become a professional soccer player, start playing soccer when I was four, playing indoor, which we call futsal. Mm. And I played futsal until I was about 10, 11. Then I transitioned to, to the 11 v 11 big field. And then I started playing some serious competitions, federation, everything. So I played for a club near my city. It's a third division club called Balpedon FC. Mm-hmm. Or not many people know about good level. Then played there until I was about 17. Then I had a spell at Vasco da Gama from 17 to 18. It was a really good experience, high level, great players. And after that, uh, I didn't make the transition to U20s. And that's when, like, I decided to try something new. I want to go overseas. My agent wanted to take me to Mexico. But also my parents also, like, wanted me to, like, persuade, still, like, persuade, like, a higher Mm -hmm. um, education degree. And one of my friends told me about, like, this opportunity that he had to come to the U.S. to play and study. And I was like, well, why not? I always dream of coming to the United States I had never been before and I kind of just like embraced the opportunity took it and and came here so you went to an NAIA school first and I know a little bit about the NAIA but it's different from the NCAA what were your thoughts about as an outsider of the NCAA the NAIA at first like what do you think about it uh, I mean, when I first came here, I didn't know, like, those divisions, like, mm-hmm. NAA, NCAA, like, I had no idea how it worked. I just got familiar with it once I got here, that, like, there was all these different college divisions and everything. And my thought was, I think there was some schools at a really good level with a lot mm-hmm. of good international players, and also some schools that didn't really have a good program, and it was just a lot, like, lower level than the others yeah. so it's, it was pretty pretty mixed but they scored us at the team was really good i enjoyed my my two years there and i've had a lot of success too so what was that process like of leaving nai to go to a d1 school like how did they get to know you how do you get to know them uh i think i got lucky to get a lot of awards like all american mm-hmm. and i was always like first team region conference golden boot everything so i think the numbers helped me a lot and the awards and so i had a lot of good offers from some really good d1 schools but i decided to go to valpo because of when i went to visit i really like how the team welcomed me and financially also was the one that made the most sense for me and also the degree that was something that i always like look to because I had some other offers from some other big schools but just the academics at a private school like Valpo was what attracted mm-hmm. me the most as well yeah speaking of your awards I have stuff written down about you half my page is just your awards you have so many 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I was blown away. Like I clicked on your Wikipedia and it, it went to honors or whatever. And I was like, holy crap, that's so many. Um, so after you left college, what was that process like after you left? What, it, what were your ideas of what you were going to do in the future? Uh, I mean, I came here always with the goal of uh, getting to become a professional player. And that was always my goal in mind. And of course, after transfer, it was like, okay, and I'm going to high level D1. But luckily, I had a really, really good junior season. Mm -hmm. I was like, broke the school record on goals and everything. And at that point, I had a lot of like MLS teams reaching out for me to do camp. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Columbus Crew. And I went to do camp with them my junior year, my senior year. And at that point, I already knew I had a really good chance of getting drafted. <clears throat> but they told me that the fact that I was international would make it a lot harder because they didn't really want to spend an international spot on a guy coming out of college. So that's how yeah. it went until I got drafted. And then after that, went to Lansing. So you were still selected 90th over on the draft. So besides what happened after the draft, I am generally really curious of what the process was like being drafted. Cause we, I like in American sports, we know all about the NBA draft. It's on mm -hmm. TV and we know all about the NFL draft, but not a lot of people know a ton about the MLS super draft. So I'm kind of curious what that pre-draft pr uh, process was like for you. Uh, I mean, I think it, it's, it's pretty like, I think it's kind of like all the other drafts. It just They just told me to kind of like submit a form like to enter the draft, I guess. It went to like a pool of, I don't know how many players, but like yeah. 500, maybe more, like a thousand, I don't know. And from that pool, the team select you. And of course, like if the team knows nothing about you, they're not going to select you. But going into it, I kind of already knew I was going to because the coach at the time was uh, Ben Halter which is the national team coach and the assistant coach really liked me from the camps I did. So I knew I had a really good chance. I just didn't know if I was going to happen because I was international and they had told me that like it's different for internationals and there were so many rules, honestly. I don't know yeah. all of them, <laughs> but yeah, that's how it went. Yeah, I work for a team in the USL too and it's crazy how many rules there are for our national guy, international guys, like we can only take 10 to a game. It's or eight to a game. It's crazy. Um, so you said you signed with Lansing after, right? Yes. So what was, was your, and Lansing doesn't exist anymore, does it? No, it was just, they were just there for one year. Yeah. First year they were one and done. <laughs> <laughs> and then they came back as Lansing at night, didn't they? And then they don't, they don't exist anymore, do they? No. What happens? What's happening in Lansing? So I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> happened. And also, it was surprising because when I went to Lansing, it was after Detroit City. I also had a spell with Detroit City. Mm -hmm. And we did really well that season. We got second place in the league. It was the first year. Everyone's excited about the future. And then the owner was like, actually, I don't have much money anymore. We're going to fold. Maybe he just knew about the pandemic before everyone. Man, I guess so. I mean, he yeah. he got out early. I'm sure like when COVID hit, he was pretty happy that he, he folded pretty early. Yes. And so we... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, you're right. You go ahead. Yeah, and then from there, I went to Memphis, and then the mm. uh, whole COVID happened. Then I went back home, played in Brazil for like a – Fifty Vision Club for a little bit until I oh, had an offer. Had an offer from Chattanooga, and then I came to Chattanooga. So I was. I, it was one of my questions was when COVID hit, because it seems like you had finally like gotten to a team like that was settled. Like, and then COVID hit. Like, so what was your thoughts when COVID hit? Uh, I think I didn't handle it too well because I was here away from my family, and all I could think about was like, well. This is crazy what's going on in the world. Like, you hear all those bad news, and I can only think about, like, how much I want to be with my family. Mm -hmm. So, and even with that, like, I still think I had a good good spell with Memphis. The few mm -hmm. games I played, I think I did well. 
And then after the season, it's like, look, I, I want to go back home. I want to play in Brazil and all of that. And they were like, well, we like you here, but sure, if that's what you want to do. So I went back home, spent some time with my family that I needed. And then after that, I had uh, this one of my youth coaches took this job at like this club in Brazil, which is a good level, like in Brazil. Mm. Like it's competitive everywhere. But COVID was still around and the competition we're about to play, it's like the state level where you play like some first division, second division teams, they postponed it for like two months. And it's just like a short, like 10 game competition. So I was like, okay, maybe this is not going to work. And at the same time, like I had an offer from Chattanooga because the GM, I guess, always liked me from my landing times. And I was like, well, I guess I'll go back to the U.S. and have a full season there. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. Yeah, uh, when COVID hit, I seriously thought all sports in general were done. So I couldn't imagine that being my job. Like yeah. as a fan, it was terrible. I couldn't imagine being a, a player and what to think during that time. But no, yeah, it was it was crazy. I mean, not only sports, like you didn't know what was gonna happen in the world in general. Yeah. Everyone was like, Well, no one knows about all this disease, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Well, I guess I need to be close to family. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my um, I actually have a Brazilian cousin-in-law. She, I have two Brazilian cousins-in-law. They're from Sao Paulo, and they moved here. Well, one of them moved here right for COVID, and stayed in, and stayed here during COVID, and then got married to my cousin. So she got trapped here, and then didn't get to go <laughs> back to her family. So, yeah. um, but I kind of want to go back to your college days because when I talked to Lucas, and I talked to a lot of internationals. And they talked about how in other countries, the term student athlete wasn't really as strong as it is in America. And they talked about how it was kind of just like school and then sports. Is that like how you felt when you got to America as a college student yeah. athlete? Yeah, that's what I said. Like, I think one appeal for me to come here it was because I could still play mm -hmm. and have a degree. Like in Brazil, you guys to a point, you're like, you're either going to play, yeah. right? to become a pro or you're going to study you can do both things like you can yeah. here so that was like a big thing i was like well that's sounds like i can have both so why not is school he says school here is easier so is school in america easier in your opinion uh i mean i don't know about like more like the hardest like uh medicine like doctor school mm -hmm. or like dental school like engineering because i never done any of those yeah but i think if you're just gonna go get like a general education like a business or marketing i think it's easier here than if you go to like college in brazil yes yeah and honestly like for what i've heard on the international guys on the team i work for is that school here is apparently a piece of cake compared to other countries so i didn't know that so when I, yeah, I'm in school right now, so I'm kind of feel bad about complaining. Especially those online classes. Those are just so easy. Man. Oh, yeah. Them. Online classes. They, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, that's the only reason I graduated high school is online classes because those <laughs> are the easiest things on the planet. And yeah. I wish I like, I want to get back to school and like do like actual, like in-person stuff because all my classes the next semester are in person, but there were some classes this semester. I don't know if I did so well and I would have done a whole lot better if they were up online that's for sure yeah <laughs> i love i loved class online i really yeah. did um so you currently uh your team chattanooga sits seventh place but from what i i didn't know this about usl one is it's one of the most competitive leagues i've looked at because you guys are seventh place and with three points from the top so what is your goal and what is your team's goal for the rest of the season like how are you going to approach the rest of the season uh, I think, like you said, it's, it's a very competitive league. Mm -hmm. Like, no doubt, like, every game is a battle. There's no, like, how the team's just going to go blow past everyone. That doesn't really happen in this league. And I think the first goal is to get to the playoffs because that's where anything can happen. You get in the playoffs, like, you can you can win a championship. So mm -hmm. I think our main goal right now is to get in the playoffs. And personally, just score more goals, get more assists, and try to help the team as much as I can. 
Well, I, I read through your stats from earlier in career and you are a freaking goal machine. I mean, you had what, you had 30, 22 goals at Brian. It's yeah. insane. Um, but you have some playoff experience in USL one, don't you? Yeah, I've been on playoffs uh, in all the, the, the years I played. Mm -hmm. Never won, yeah, but hopefully this year. Well, I know that you, I don't remember exactly what year it is. I was just reading about it, but um, you played Greenville in the semifinals and went to extra time. So, kid, like, talk about that. Like, what were your emotions? What were the team's emotions when you had that heartbreak? Uh, it was a pretty tough game because we started – we start off so well we had like three four chances that we should have put it away hmm. and then the game kind of got into like a playoff game just no it was no one wanted to make a mistake and then on overtime they had one chance and they buried us and after that we just threw numbers forward and they scored a second one and we lost the game mm -hmm. that's always rough especially in extra time yep so reflecting on your career what has been your favorite moment and what has been your least favorite moment your, or your hardest challenge? Uh, my favorite moment, I think I'm never going to forget. Uh, we had a <laughs> game. I was in Lansing, a game against mm -hmm. Madison. And I came on with six minutes left. We were tie 1-1. One, one. Then the first ball I get, I dribble past three guys, do a 1-2 of a striker. He left foot 2-1. They come to tie the game 2-2. Two, two. Then the last ball of the game, I got another ball. Dribble, <laughs> dribble, pass to this guy, our striker, Bruce. And he scores a win 3-2. So that was like the craziest six minutes <laughs> I've ever played in my career. And it was Definition awesome. Definition of super sub right there. That is a super sub. Yeah. And then I think the worst moment, I think last year I had to deal with some two bad injuries, like a hamstring tear. Mm -hmm. And then I had like a back issue. That took me like four or five months to recover and it was really tough. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to go to, this is a generic question, but I like asking the people on here is what is some like real true advice for younger players that you would give? Uh, I think just perseverance. Like I was a guy that a lot of people told me no in the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. And I just persevere. And every time I work harder, like, okay, like, also, like, when someone tells you no, ask why. Because I'd ask, okay, why? And then I work on that. The next no I had, I was like, okay, why? Then I work on that. And just, just, that just made me like a more complete and better player. And perseverance, I think for me, is the word, like, just keep going. Mm -hmm. Don't take no for an answer. I like that okay why advice. That's one thing I've never been as a person who can confront knows, that's for sure. But I like that advice. It's, I, I'm, I'm going to make a TikTok out of that one. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, a lot of, I mean, I'm assuming like you're probably trying to like go to college or get a scholarship or whatever camps or even pro. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, when a coach tells you no, okay, you're like, okay, coach, but why? Why do I have to work on it? If you work on those things, it's going to make you a better player and a better person too. So what are the things in your career that you've figured out why and things that you've worked on? Uh, I think when I was, I was a really good player when I was like 17. I was a midfielder mm -hmm. at Vasco. This was a top academy. And then the transition to you to any, I just like the coach, there's too many players. It's harder. It's like that's really high level. And he was like, well, I think a really good player, but you need to work on your left foot. And he was right. Like, I was just yeah. so true so much my right. I would just use my right all the time. And since that time, I started working really hard on my left foot. I was like, I need to be able to dribble to both sides, dribble with both feet, like finish, cross, do everything that I can do with my right with my left. And I worked a lot on that. And mm. nowadays, I can do everything I can do with my right. I can do with my left. And made me a lot better player. Yeah. The weak, weak foot is a huge thing. Yeah. And I hope people will listen to that because I know weak foot is a huge thing to work on. Um, last question to kind of wrap it up. And you come from the footballing capital of the world, basically. So who was your favorite player growing up? 
my favorite player growing up was Felipe Coutinho because he played oh. the same academy as I did, and I mm -hmm. think he was an animal. He was a monster, like so technical, so clean, mm -hmm. and I loved watching that guy. But if we're gonna go all time, there's this player not many people know, but it's worth googling. It's called Zico. He played for Flamengo. Zico. And he was just a player. What a player. I have a big sock knowledge, but I, I have to admit, I have not heard of him. But I do have a Flamengo jersey. Yeah. I thought about wearing it. Z, that's, that's my team. ZICO. It's the biggest ZICO. idol, the biggest player Flamengo ever had. He's mm -hmm. a beast. Coutinho answered, took me by surprise, but got to love Coutinho. I mean, fantastic player. Who he said? You said Felipe Coutinho? Yeah. That, that answer took me by surprise, but that's a good yeah, answer, that's for sure. Yeah, I loved him. He and his prime was different. Oh, yeah. I, that's like around the time. Like, what was that? Like 2013, 14, 15, like around that area. That's when I started watching, like mm. for real. And he was insane. Like, he yeah. generally was insane. Well, Rafa, thank you for coming on. I'm sorry. I still cannot pronounce your last name, but I will work on it. No worries. No worries, Caleb. I wish you the best. And thank you. If anything, you can let me know. They need some more cheese. They cannot get some more, please. No, they need some more heat. Ready, turn it up now. I'm going to need some more cheese.